Welcome back, Nintendo 64 fans. It is time for us to review another game. A very special game. Star Fox 64 is the only game in the Star Fox series to be released on the Nintendo 64. Fear not, however. This game has a whole lot to offer once you dig beneath the surface. I originally thought I wouldn't have enough content to talk about, but I was dead wrong. I had to cut some material I really wanted to analyze because the video was just getting way too long. This is the first Nintendo 64 review I've done where I could safely say I could really make this into a two-part series without any problem. However, I am going to just keep to the main points here, as I do want to keep playing more games and making these videos, and being a one-gamer show, I am strapped for time. That being said, feel free to whip out your rumble packs, as the 1997 Star Fox 64 was the first game to make use of a heavy cube that forces your hands to shake uncontrollably. So strap in and check your G-Diffuser systems. We have an entire solar system to navigate in less than half an hour. Luckily, we have some beyond overpowered chips and charismatic allies to assist us along the way. Before we go any further, I will commend the use of voice acting on this game. It is incredible and perfectly executed. I don't use that word lightly either. Usually I would have to explain everything going on, because in this era of gaming, the characters didn't have actual voice acting. It was more just a hodgepodge of sounds. I'm looking at you, Banjo-Kazooie. Actually, that was acceptable. It was more humorous than anything. But Star Fox is taking some of my glory away by telling the story itself. Anyways, I'll let General Pepper have the stage here, and I'll step back when needed. Message from General Pepper. Priority one. We need your help, Star Fox. Andros has declared war. He's invaded the Lilat system and is trying to take over Corneria. Our army alone can't do the job. Hurry, Star Fox. And the Star Fox team takes hurry to a whole new level. Look at this warp speed, and they aren't even breathing hard. We are then introduced to our mercenaries, the analytical and bullied Slippy Toad, the boisterous and should have retired a decade ago Peppy Hare, the most arrogant Alpha Chad in the entire Lilat system, Falco Lombardi, and our hero Fox McCloud, who is very much the amicable protagonist in all truthfulness. This is one of the few times we will see them outside their roar wing which is the primary fighter jet the Star Fox team uses. Most of the time, you just see their heads poking up through the window. This is quite comical, because there is no way there is a full body in these ships. Either that, or there would be zero room for the engine and other components. Oh well, I won't nitpick. We have a galaxy to save. Let's make like an egg and scramble. Before you begin, a dry narrator does give you more background on what's happening in this game. Essentially, Andross is a mad scientist and almost destroyed Corneria with biological weapons. General Pepper had him banished to the far planet Venom, essentially a prison. However, this didn't stop Andross's crazy experiments, and James McCloud, who was Fox's father, led the original Star Fox team to stop him, but they ultimately failed. Five years later, Andross attacks the Lilat system as a whole. General Pepper enlists the help of the new Star Fox team, led by Fox McCloud, to put an end to Andross's terror. Yes, you all know me too well. As usual, I suggest going to training to get the controls down pat. We are greeted by Rob64, who acts as a communicator and operates the Great Fox. He'll sporadically send you needed supplies as well. The one who gives us the training, though, is this wide-eyed stud. I learned something new doing this analysis. He is a Tanuki, and his name is Yaru Depon. How badass is that? A French-Japanese raccoon? to teach you how to navigate and how to fire projectiles. You can stay here as long as you want, and honestly, I would enjoy this moment. This is unfortunately Depon's only appearance. The main game is where we begin our journey to take down the evil Andros and his cronies. We get an overview of the Lilat system, and don't let this intimidate you. There are quite a few celestial bodies, but fear not, you don't have to complete all of them to take down Andros. In fact, you aren't even allowed to do so. You are limited to a path of seven courses per playthrough, so really the main plotline can be accomplished within an hour. You'll need to run three times to complete all paths and to get the true form of Andros exposed and defeated. We'll start our journey on Corneria, as this is the default and forced option. 
I guess it is important to save the only planet we can establish a habitat. Before every mission, besides Venom, General Pepper and Fox have a quote, briefing. It's usually just one sentence each, where Fox says he'll do his best. So humble, I tell you. And once again, this game's stellar voice acting takes my job. Go ahead and introduce yourselves, Fox team. Open the wing! Check your G-Diffuser system. Falco here. I'm fine. This is Peppy. All systems go. Flipping here. I'm okay. I see him up ahead. Let's rock and roll! Our game takes off with an overview of the mission number and the status slash health of your team. Most levels are either corridor mode, which is a straight path forward, or all range mode, where you can have an area to stop and change directions. The basic firing is either smashing the A button like a lunatic, my preference, or holding A and charging a small blast. Throughout your journey, on each course you will come across several items to enhance the R-Wing. Here's a snapshot of the available items according to the official instructions manual. There are three items I recommend going out of your way to collect, as they make the game much easier. These are the laser power-up, the smart bomb, and the shield ring. We'll see in action how each of these can significantly help defeat the forces of Andros. The laser beam item is signified by the letter L, wonder what that could stand for, with two green beams on its side. You are able to pick up two of these for maximum effect. The first time you collect the laser beam, it will transform your single green laser into twin green lasers. A lot like Galaga, the twin lasers make it easier to hit enemies, and it also just looks way better in my opinion. The second time you pick up a laser beam is where things get spicy. You'll transform your twin green lasers into twin blue lasers, also called hyper lasers. This is where you want to be. Great accuracy and increased damage, and you look like a badass. Our next item has several benefits and is overall the best item in the game for its usefulness in several categories. The Golden Shield Ring. A few things can happen when you collect this bad boy. I'll go ahead and give you a rundown of the user interface while we're at it. The first thing it always does is restore lost health to your R-Wing. Your health is signified by the red arrow. Also, when you collect three rings, signified by the golden arrow, your health bar will increase. Only once, however. The large number below your health bar is your score. Shoot down enemies to increase this. The R-Wing with the number by it is your lives. Use sparingly. The thin blue bar is your boost meter. It will replenish automatically when flying normal speed. And last, but certainly in no circumstance the least, is our Smart Bomb Inventory. These really pack a punch and are excellent at area of effect damage. These can cause your score to skyrocket if used correctly. They are identified as a red hexagon with the letter B stamped on them. Again, wonder what this could possibly mean. Using these are very straightforward. Simply press B in the direction you want to fire, and press B again to detonate. Boom goes the dynamite. The level will continue, and they are pretty uniform in their approach. However, they do have different environments and enemies that make each place unique. There is a special aspect to each level, and that is the boss battle at the end. These are very well done in my opinion. They are fun, interesting, and have a hilarious and obnoxious personality in some circumstances. I don't know why exactly, but it seems like the species of all of these bosses are either ape, reptile, or some type of imp creature. I guess there is some kind of pact with these classes, who knows. Also, before we go further, I can't stress this enough, keep Slippy alive on each level. His enemy shield analyzed is so, so useful. Give this toad a round of applause, please. Slippy is my favorite ally, as he's the most useful, simply for this one reason. Slippy will display a boss health bar similar to that of your own on the left side of the screen. This is useful to see if you're actually doing any damage to the boss. Most boss fights aren't particularly difficult. Essentially, you need to spam missiles in their weak points, which are most of the time signified by a bright light or an opening in their ship. At first glance, it doesn't look like I'm doing any damage to the boss. This is because most bosses either have some sort of appendage or shield you need to destroy before you can start hitting their weak point. Also, your allies will give you hints sometimes too as to how to defeat each boss. Again, more incentive to keep them all alive. 
Defeating bosses is one of the best feelings in Star Fox. The developers did a fantastic job of making you feel accomplished. There's that slow motion framing, and then the dramatic explosion to really make you relish in your victories. You can really tell Fox is a great leader too. After every boss battle or completed objective, Fox checks in with his team before heading to the Great Fox. Most of the time, your allies will either say that they are okay, or they will praise you for your stellar performance. This game can really stroke your ego sometimes, and I absolutely love it. Once all of our team checks in and gives us their briefing, we all receive a little health to our R-Wings, and you'll receive your final score and the status of the mercenaries before proceeding to the next level. Also, you will gain another life for your victory. Great job, team. Let's head back to the Great Fox and proceed to the next level. As I mentioned earlier, there are multiple paths that are available depending on your actions in each level and how you complete the course. If we take Corneria's easy path to Medio, we are able to either go to the easier path of Fortuna, the blue arrow, or Katina, the red arrow. Let's look and see how to end up on each planet. Towards the end of Medio are several blue spiral points. These will make your ship spin faster after you hit each point. If you miss one of these, you will stay on course to Fortuna. However, on the flip side, see what I did there? If you do end up hitting all the blue spirals, you will end up breaking the laws of physics and find yourself in this very obscure vortex. This new plane of existence seems more like an acid trip than anything. There are bright tie-dye colors and odd creatures and easter egg meteors. The whole thing is just very bizarre. There are two distinct ways to see which path will be available to you at the end. Mission complete and mission accomplished. If we miss our vortex points and we kill the boss to go to Fortuna, the end will say mission to complete. Complete is the easier path. If we hit the vortexes, it will say accomplished, the harder path. In most instances, it's better to take the hard path. If you go easy, you just go straight to Fortuna, no questions asked. However, if you end up taking the hard path by hitting all the vortex points and going to Katina, you will have three options available to you. Proceed to next course, which simply means go to Katina and continue on the more difficult path. You can also choose to go to Fortuna by hitting change course. This is the overall advantage of getting mission accomplished rather than mission complete. You can also retry the course in exchange for one R-Wing if you want to increase your score on that course. As I said before, most courses are corridor mode and the game will force you to get to the end, so really there won't be any holdups. Most courses either take place in a space zone, such as Sector Y, seen here, or they'll take you to a place on a planet, or in this case, a sun. Here we are on solar, and as you can see, the unique feature here is you take consistent damage because of the heat. Not really sure it was necessary to get within 10 feet of the sun, but hey, as long as they pay me. Not all courses feature this R-Wing, however, even though it is the best vehicle. Don't debate me on this. Some courses will force you to use a Landmaster, which is a tank that functions similar to the R-Wing, Sans Flight. It does have some cool barrel rolls and hover abilities. It is good to shake things up a bit, but truthfully, flight is so much more useful on these courses. Having to hover to get an item may take some practice, as you have to time it pretty spot on. Also, I just feel like a sitting duck whenever enemies are blasting you from the sky. Luckily, our allies are in our wings. See? Perfect example right here. Wouldn't it be so much easier for us to be in an R-Wing to get this shield ring? They're really making it tough on us. And the third vehicle. I'm getting nauseous just thinking about it. The third and most obnoxious vehicle is the Blue Marine. Luckily, it's only used on the planet Aquas, but this is required to take the difficult path to get the true ending. I don't think it's the actual submarine that's bad. It's the horrible lighting in this level. I get it's done on purpose because instead of bombs, you are given unlimited torpedoes that help you light your path. The best strategy here is to just spam the A and B button simultaneously to get through this tomfoolery. Let's check in with Slippy to see what he thinks. Thanks, Slip. We also have some valuable allies who will help us on specific levels. Cat Monroe is a pink and white cat who pilots the cat's paw. We see her on Zonus, and then again she helps us in Sector Z when she assists us in defending the Great Fox against an enemy ambush. We also run into Bill Gray, a loyal good boy who also went to Military Academy with our hero Fox McCloud. We first assist Bill on Katina in defending against a large enemy force trying to destroy the planet. When we successfully help our canine companion defend Katina, he will then show up on Solar to assist us. See? Told you he was a loyal good boy. Unfortunately, there is a powerful counter unit. I'll let them introduce themselves. I can't let you do that, Star Fox. Andros has ordered us to take you down. 
Happy. Long time no see. Andros's enemy is my enemy. Just what I need to see. Star Wolf. Star Wolf is a team enlisted by the main antagonist, Andros, to put an end to the Star Fox team. And boy, does it almost work. These guys are the hardest part of the game, in my opinion. Wolf O'Donnell is a wolf that is by far the most powerful of the team. He's especially ruthless the second time you face him. Leon Pulaski is a chameleon and is quite creepy in his mannerisms. He reminds me of a cunning butler. Andrew O'Coiney. This is Andros' nephew, heir to the throne of Venom. He's completely immature and isn't worthy of the title. Pigma Dengar is a pig and the ultimate betrayer. He was part of the original Star Fox team alongside James McCloud, Fox's father, as well as Peppy Hare. Due to Pigma's betrayal, James was unfortunately killed and Dengar went to join Andross's forces. They'll initially fight Star Wolf on Fortuna, and they aren't too bad to down on this planet. You fight these guys in all range mode, which allows you to maneuver in any direction in a confined space. Wolf can be rough to shoot down because he's quite agile and good at deflecting your attacks. The other three are a joke, and sometimes your allies can take them on themselves. However, if you take the hard path, they will be guarding the entrance to Andross's lair on Venom. And believe me when I say they come equipped. Don't get too cocky, Star Fox. Let's see how you handle our new ships. Too bad Dad's not here to see you fail. We'll make sure you never reach Andrus. We'll just see about that, Star Wolf. And they were close to being correct. I nearly failed on my mission, but I finally got Wolf down, and the way to Andros was open. I guess Fox does get somewhat of a hero complex here at the end. There really is zero reason to go in there alone. We've depended on our allies this long, and now we just shove them to the side, I guess. In any case, we go through this odd pipe opening that appears to go to the core of the planet. To live inside a planet is pretty hardcore. Ha! <laughs> See what I did there? We go through this obscure metal corridor to hopefully meet and defeat Andros. And lo and behold, we finally come face to... much larger face with him. See, General Pepper always fails to tell us vital information about the enemy. Why didn't he say Andros was a massive floating head? Well, whatever. We are here and we need to get paid. His first phase is a bit of a breeze. The gravity is way off here, so just be wary. Just shoot his hands until they, uh... Pop? Disintegrate? The best part of this fight is when he tries to suck you up. You can either boost to the side, or launch a bomb in his mouth, and he'll flail around like a madman and easily expose his hands for you to take out. Once his hands are gone, spam missiles between his eyes. If you took the easy path, a robot Andross will fight you. However, if you took the hard path, you get Andross's true form, and you must fight his brain. There is a bit of difficulty in this true form phase. You'll go into all range mode, which is never a good sign. He'll then unleash his eyeballs from his head, which are connected by electricity. Quite horrifying if you really think about it. Once you blast away and destroy his unsocketed eyeballs, his cerebellum will become targetable. Here's where things get rough. He'll teleport around and it's hard to get a good shot at his cerebellum. If you get too close, his tentacles will wrap you up and destroy your wings, which make flying extremely difficult. Just keep at it though, and keep firing away at his cerebellum, as this is the last phase. Once that is destroyed, Andros knows of his impending downfall and he decides to take you down with him in a blaze of glory. R.I.P. Fox McCloud. And that's it, folks. Star Fox goes down in a noble sacrifice and is never seen from or heard of again. He only exists in legend. We salute his service and the sacrifices he made for Corneria. Don't ever give up, my son. Father? Ha! <laughs> gotcha there. Just kidding. James McCloud comes to our rescue. Odd lore here, and I can't really find confirmation on if James is truly dead or not. There is evidence for and against, but I'm thinking this is not an illusion, but the real James McCloud is actually with us. This really is a heartwarming moment, as James and Fox get one last hoorah together. James leads the way and shows Fox how to escape the collapsing corridors of Venom. James is able to see Fox lead the old team and find new allies along the way. I wish I could find more information on Fox and James's relationship. I can only speculate that it was a strong bond, and I really feel for Fox losing his dad. I hope this is good closure for him, and to know that his dad truly always cared for his well-being. Fox blasts out of the Venom corridors along with his father. 
You can see his father doesn't return to the great fox, but takes off into the distance. I can only speculate that this is for an unknown specific purpose. Thankfully, Fox made it out alive, and we are able to return to Corneria to inform General Pepper of our success in taking down Andros. It is time for our award ceremony and to collect our paycheck. Well done, guys. Star Fox, we are in your debt. I would be honored to have you as part of the Cornarian... Oh, no, sir. We prefer doing things our own way. Great Fox is ready to go. It's time for us to go now. Our characters once again run at a ridiculous speed into the sunset. For real, they are faster on foot than they are in their R-wings. We are then given the final end screen with a beautiful view of a fire red sunset along with our total score for that run. And would you look at that, I got 1-1-1-1. One, 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 one. How cool is that? And hell yes, I got the top score. Take that, 1997 Bradical. I am so much better than my 7 year old self. There is one last thing we have to do. Check the invoice. Oh yeah, son, we made bank today. I don't know much about Star Fox currency, but 71k SP better be a lot. And that's it, folks, for the main game. Star Fox 64 has a very entertaining multiplayer mode. You can have up to four players that act as the four main members of the Star Fox team. Unfortunately, there is no co-op. It's straight head-to-head -head in a battle royale or a point system. Also, in an unfortunate circumstance, during the making of this video, we are at a stay-at-home order here in the U.S. due to a certain pandemic. So I have to show you how this works all by my lonesome, because I live all by my lonesome. The major downside to this is there are only three courses overall to choose from, depending on if you do a time trial or a battle mode. The cool part of this is you can choose which vehicle you want when you're on the ground at least. The R-Wing, the Landmaster, or you can go really hardcore and just use a gun, which is way more entertaining than it sounds. The first two are pretty self-explanatory if you played the game. Simply navigate the course and fire at each other. I'm actually really surprised this game lets you do multiplayer by yourself. There is literally nothing to shoot you. You just roam around indefinitely. The other three panels are just camera mode of yourself, and it's completely pointless to be here. Using the gun on time trial mode is a different story. The controls are wonky, as you use the R button to go forward. Fortunately, you can hold the A button, and it continuously fires. This mode is unlocked by killing a certain number of enemies on each planet. I really wish someone were here to play against me to see how this gun sizes up against an R-Wing. And there you have it folks, my in-depth analysis of Star Fox 64. Alrighty folks, and there you have it, my in-depth analysis of Star Fox 64. And I'll be honest with you guys, uh, I was way more impressed with this game than I thought it would be. Uh, don't get me wrong, I did enjoy this game as a kid, I played through the campaign quite a few times and played quite a bit on multiplayer with the kids in the neighborhood. but. Uh, I'm really glad I replayed this game. I have a lot of newfound respect for some of the features I just really didn't appreciate as a kid. Uh, first and foremost, like I said in the video, a lot of Nintendo 64 games didn't have very good voice acting, but uh, this game definitely changed all that. And really the characters, um, all the characters, both allies and enemies, uh, I think were, were very well done, had interesting storylines. Uh, the Star Fox team was great. You really felt like you were part of a team, especially with Rob and General Pepper um, as well. Uh, the enemies, Star Wolf, just a great addition to, to the game, having that, that sense of rivalry and not just with Andross's forces, but I mean, they are Andross's forces, but they really kind of felt like their own entity and really like a, like a, like a rival team that's, that's always out to get you. Um, in terms of things I didn't like, there's there's not a whole lot. I mean, it was just a tad bit short. I know I have that complaint quite a bit on games. Uh, but seven courses, you, you could theoretically just use the boost on all of those and get through the game within an hour or so. But that's really not the spirit of this game. It's meant to be ran through a few times in order to get the full effect and get the true ending. Um, 
But I guess that that would be really my only biggest complaint. My my only complaint really. Um, I could just I have so many good things to say about this game, and you know, like I said at the beginning, I thought that this would just be one a short video. In fact, I was gonna do just a just a normal playthrough and <laughs> just speed through it real quick. Um, but no, once I get started playing it, I realized there was a there was a ton to talk about and a lot of things I didn't realize that uh, that could be done in this game. But overall, uh, oh, also, yeah, I show these off all the time. But yes, I do still have the box. Uh, seen better days. It's crushed a lot. Like uh, I, I wish I would have taken better care. Take better care of your stuff, everybody. Uh, the advice I have here. But uh, I give this game. Out of ten, I'm gonna give it a. I'm gonna give it the same as Banjo Kazooie. I think it was a nine three or nine four, because I, th I think it's very. It has its own, uh, really its own positives that that really make it stand out. It's a very unique game. Uh, enjoyed it. Unfortunately, the Star Fox franchise recently has kind of well, lacked. I think the last game I had, what is it? It's the Star Fox Adventures. After that, I kind of quit. It wasn't a bad game though. But uh, yeah, I highly su suggest playing Star Fox. In fact, it's probably one, I think it is one of the best selling games. I think it sold about four million, but incredible game. Uh, thank you all for watching this. Hope you all learned something. Uh, we'll see you guys next time. Peace out.